Journal are dismissed to Children's Church, and as they make their way, I want to introduce you to Carl Barth. Not only did he have a great pair of reading glasses, but he was an excellent, a brilliant, really, theologian, and he wasn't perfect by any means, but he did a phenomenal job of defending the sovereignty of God. He did an excellent job doing that, and he is one of He's considered one of the most brilliant theological minds of the 20th century by most scholars, I would say. And in 1962, during a conference in which he was speaking, during a Q&A session, someone asked him this question. What is the greatest thought you've ever had? And if you know his works and his accomplishments, you would think that he would give a response that is just dripping with complexity, absolutely unique, completely novel, and just full of so much lofty language that only the most brilliant minds could understand. But when he was asked this question, what is the greatest thought you've ever had? He responded with a line from a simple hymn and said, the greatest thought I have ever had is that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now when I first heard that quote, I'll be honest, I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. I thought it was absolutely immature, and I lost all respect that I had for him. But today, I couldn't agree more. Why? Because despite of all my failures, despite of all the hurt that I have poured into others' lives, despite all the opportunities of service that I have missed out on due to my own selfishness, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, perfection itself, loves me. Jesus loves you and me. That He paid the price for all of our mistakes. He paid the price for all of our shame and guilt on the cross. He took that burden upon Himself. And as He says so perfectly in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served, although He deserved to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many, for you and for me. Jesus loves you and me. And today as we go through the gospel according to Mark, we are going to bask in that wonderful truth. Why? For two reasons. One, we don't know it all. As D.L. Moody once said, many of us think we know something of God's love, but centuries hence we shall admit we never had found much out about it. Columbus discovered America, but what did he know about the great lakes, rivers, forests, and mountains? He died without knowing much about what he had discovered. So, many of us have discovered something of the love of God. But there are heights, depths, and lengths of it we do not know. So we want to dive into it and we want to discover the heights, the depths, and the length of Jesus Christ's love for you and me. Second reason is we're forgetful. I taught calculus for three years, and by the end of the third year, I had it down. I didn't need to prep. I didn't need to prep at all. I had it down. But if you were to ask me today to find the derivative of any polynomial without using the book, I would rip my hair out because I would be so frustrated because I have forgotten. We're human and we forget and we need to be reminded, especially concerning the infinite subject of Jesus Christ's awesome love for you and for me. We need to be reminded. So that's what we're going to do as we go into God's Word. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And as you're turning to Mark chapter 3, let me give you a brief outline of what we're going to see in Mark chapter 3. First, we're going to see the devoted nature of Jesus Christ's love, then his daring, the daring nature of Jesus Christ's love, and then the deepness of our Savior's love for you and me. That is the outline of today's 
message. It is the devoted, daring, and deep love that Jesus has for you and for me. So let's go ahead and divide, d- dive into the devoted aspect of Jesus Christ's love. We're in Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 20. Mark chapter 3, verse 20, reads this way. It says, Then he, that's Jesus, then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. Stop right there. There's one thing I want to clarify. When the text says he or Jesus went home, it's not implying that Jesus went to the place of his birth, to his hometown, to the home in which he grew up in. We know that because in the following verse, Jesus' family hear of his teaching and they have to go to him. Also in verse 31, we see that the family is outside the home. They have come to the home, they're outside the home, and they're looking in, attempting to get a hold of Jesus Christ. So this is not Jesus Christ's home in the sense of it's the home that he grew up in. It is not that. Also, it's not a home that he purchased. It is not a home that he purchased. We know that he is in Capernaum now, and he has been using Peter's house. The literal translation here is, then he entered a house. There's an article there. So this is an a house. This is Peter's house, most likely, that he ministered to in First Peter, excuse me, Mark chapter 1, and then also in Mark chapter 2, and here he is again. So one question one may have is, well, why did the translators use the word home here? It's because they're trying to communicate a concept that is happening. When Jesus was in Galilee, he established his home base in Capernaum, most likely in Peter's household. It is sort of like his home away from home in the northern region of Israel from which he goes out and comes back in, goes out and comes back in. So it is not his original home that he grew up in. It's not a house that he purchased. It's a house that Peter, most likely, is allowing him to use to minister from. So with that brief clarification, we go back and we look at this verse, verse 20, and we remember what happened last week in verses 7 through 12. What happened? We saw Jesus perform a myriad of physical miracles. We saw him cast out multiple demons. He was performing the miraculous, and the crowd was captivated. They were captivated. And after he performs that ministry, he selects his disciples. And then here, he's at this house, and the crowd has gathered again. And it's so crowded that he can't even eat a meal. The literal translation is he couldn't eat a piece of bread. They're so captivated by Christ. This house is so compact with people eager to hear, eager eager to be touched by the life of Christ. And you would think everyone would react that way to Jesus. But they don't. How does his family react? Look at verse 21. How does Jesus' family react? It says, And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, He was out of his mind. Now there are three questions. There's the first one that I want to address before we hit the devoted love of Jesus Christ. How we see the devoted nature of Jesus Christ love in this verse and the first question is who is the family being referred to here the word family here is actually a greek obscure term it is not the usual term for family so what so often scholars or commentators will do is they'll say this is not since it's such an obscure term it's not jesus's immediate family it's not his mother it's not his brothers it's someone else perhaps fam extended family But what do we do with that? We scroll down to verse 31 and we find out exactly who it is. Verse 31, it says, Then Jesus' mother and his brothers came. Standing outside, they sent word to him to summon him. Mark identifies exactly who the family members are. They are his mother, Mary, and his four younger siblings. That is who it is. But people will say this and say, come into this passage and say, well, there's a break. There's verse 21, then there's verse 31. You have an injection here. Maybe it's a different story. But for that, we have to understand how Mark writes. How does he write? He'll typically start a story, and then as that story is happening, he'll inject another story that's happening simultaneously. And then he'll finish that story later on. We see this with a woman who had a flow of love for 12 years. Jesus is touched by, or excuse me, The man Jesus is ministering the centurion. We have this lady who needs healing, and then he comes back to the centurion, and there's healing. It's a pattern that Mark uses. 
All right? So it is Jesus' family. It is Mary. It is the four younger brothers. And to that, some may say, well, John, Mary had all of the angels. She had the archangel Gabriel come to her and tell her exactly who Jesus is. She had Elizabeth confirm it. She had Joseph confirm it with his vision. She raised a sinless child. Why would she ever doubt? Why would she ever think that Jesus is out of his mind? And some scholars will gather a hold of that thinking and think, you know what, they start out with the assumption that Mary is perfect and was sinless, and then therefore this cannot happen. This cannot be Mary that is doubting Jesus. But to that I would say this. You and I, if we're believers in Jesus Christ, have God in us. Holy Spirit is in us. We also have God's Word right before us. None of us have not heard from Jesus if we've read this. We've all had God speak to us. Yet all of us, with God in us and His Word before us, all of us struggle with doubting Jesus. Think of John the Baptist. Before he's even born, he knows who Jesus is. He leaps in the womb when Mary is pregnant with Jesus and comes near. He knows before he's born who Jesus is. Then he baptizes Jesus, and then Jesus comes out of the water, and right before John the Baptist's eyes, what happens? Audible confirmation from God the Father. He speaks and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then he also gets the visible confirmation that Jesus is who he says he is, and he has the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus, and he sees that. He has all that confirmation, yet what does John the Baptist do later on in his ministry? He doubts. He questions, and he asks Jesus, are you really the one? So we can totally, it is safe to assume, it is safe to say that Mary is having doubts. That Mary, yes, even though she's the mother of God and has experienced all of that, she needs a Savior too. She makes mistakes also. So who is the family? It is Mary, the mother of Jesus, unfortunately, and his siblings. Next, what does the word seize imply here? Some of your texts may say restrain or to get a hold of. What's implying? Well, this same word is used of Jesus Christ when he's arrested. It's used of the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. They are seizing him with the same Greek word. It's also used of the arrest of John the Baptist. And what does that imply for us? That communicates to us that this is not a, a minor incident. His family is not like, oh, it's no big deal. He just has one or two few screws loose. It's not everything. No, it's not saying that at all. It's implying, it's telling us that this is a major concern. That his family is out to seize him, out to stop his ministry. They are getting up, they are leaving Nazareth, and they're going to put an end to this nonsense. That is what it implies. And the next question is, why does Jesus' family react this way? There's no doubt that Mary told of all the miraculous things that happened at Jesus' birth to all Jesus' siblings. They all know that. They have all grown up with a sinless child, a sinless teenager. That's got to be confirmation enough. A sinless young adult. That's confirmation even more. A sinless adult. That's maybe even confirmation even more. They have all of this. They have miracles. We, before this, John tells us that Jesus is in Nazareth and he has already turned the water into wine. He's already done that. Right before their eyes. He's already been in Nazareth and he hasn't healed myriads of people in Nazareth, but he has healed people. They have visual conf confirmation that Jesus is who he says he is. They have audible confirmation of who Jesus is that Jesus is who he says he is. They have physical confirmation that Jesus is who he says he is, yet his family doubts all the same. Why would they do this? I think the first reason is fear. What is Jesus doing throughout his entire ministry? He's battling it out. He is going up against the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious elite who have power. And there's no doubt in my mind that those powerful authorities went to Jesus' family and said, you better put a stop to this by any means necessary. I think that's a good reason why they may be doing this. The second reason is because he's family. I mean, we all tend to not give people in our family the credit they deserve. Let me give you an example of this. My cousin Mike Penworthy, 
played for the NBA Lakers. He has a big fat ring on his finger. Won the championships with Shaq and Kobe. And you're like, whoa, that's so cool. And I'm like, oh, it's just Mike. It's like, no big deal. He's family. I know him. And Jesus' family are people too. And maybe they fell into that way of thinking. I mean, just imagine if your son or your brother one day said, I'm God. Doubts would begin to flow through your mind like wild. Third reason is, and I actually think this is the most serious one. Um, Jesus' ministry up to this point, if you're on the outside looking in, and you don't know exactly what Jesus is saying, what he's communicating, what does it look like? You're on the outside looking in, and it has all the makings of a cult. It's a brand new destructive cult. Think about it. Jesus is surrounding himself with the disenfranchised. Jesus is having people leave their jobs. He's having them sell possessions. He's setting himself up as the ultimate authority. From the outside looking in, if you don't know any better, it looks like a cult. And maybe it's from a form of embarrassment his family comes to him. So those may be three reasons that we can all relate to and say, yeah, that may be a reason why they think he's out of his mind. But I want to end with a devoted love of Jesus Christ. And to get there, we need to think about Jesus' perspective in all of this. Think about being Jesus. Your birth is miraculous. Your child life is sinless. Your adult life is sinless. Your brothers see your miracles. They hear your teaching. And it can only be described as divine. Yet they that are closest to you believe you are out of your mind. That would be so frustrating. That would be painful. That would be so hurtful. They completely seek to invalidate Jesus' ministry. He is out of his mind. And to that, some of you may say, well, Jesus is God, so he knows what's going to happen. He knew this was going to come prior. So, you know what, he knows it's going to happen. He knows it's going to pass. He knows that Mary's going to eventually believe. He knows that his kids are going to believe. So, or his brothers are going to believe. So, you know what, that probably lessened the blow and it wasn't as painful as you're making this out to be. And I would say, please, let's be real. My family is great, but they're imperfect. And I can guarantee they're going to hurt me one day. I can guarantee it. Now, does me knowing that lessen the pain or take away, really, the pain when it happens? No, the pain and the hurt is still there. We are all going to heaven if we believe in Jesus Christ, a place that is sinless, a place that is perfect, without physical disability, without anything like that, completely, utterly better than this world. And we know that future, and there's comfort in that future. But does that erase the pain that we feel today, the hurt that we feel today as a result of people and us hurting one another? No. Jesus, when he comes to the tomb of Naz or Lazarus, what does he do? He doesn't have a big smile on his face. He's weeping. And he knows that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but the situation still brings hurt. The situation still brings pain because his friend had to go through that death. And also the people around him do not understand what is going on. They don't see. There is pain. There is hurt. Yet Jesus comes anyway. Jesus, we should look at this passage. I need to look at this passage with just absolute wonder and awe at the fact that Jesus knew he was going to experience every single aspect of this. Yet he came anyway. He came anyway. That is devoted love. He was willing to set himself up to live a life, not just a death, of rejection for you and me. That is devoted love. That's the love he has for you and for me. So with that devoted love, now we're going to look at the daring aspect of Jesus' love. Look at verse 22. It says, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, or Beelzebub, as many of the translations may put it. 
And by the prince of demons, he cast out demons. Stop right there. Try to imagine being Jesus here. The scribes have been reading, studying, memorizing, and teaching the Old Testament that all points to who? That all points to Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11, verse, or chapter 7, verse 26, all the way to 8, 5. The Old Testament is a shadow of things to come. What's to come? Jesus Christ. The entire thing points to Jesus Christ. They've been studying it. They've been memorizing it. Their whole life revolves around it, and they're missing it. They're absolutely missing it, and they accuse Jesus. They seek to discredit him by calling him possessed by Beelzebul or Beelzebub. What is Beelzebub? Prior to this moment, it was a reference to the Philistine ultimate god that the Jews considered Satan. At this point in time in history, it had just become another name for Satan. And you'll see that as Jesus talks, that it's another name for Satan. What has just happened? His family's just called him a lunatic. The religious leaders of God's people have just called him a liar, possessed by the devil. That would be so frustrating, but also, humanly speaking, it would be terrifying. Why would it, humanly speaking, be terrifying? Because look at who he's up against. He's up against the powerful, controlling Pharisees. And their claim, their level against them, doesn't have light consequences. It invokes a call to Jesus' blaspheming. Since Jesus is teaching, and if he's possessed by a devil, then he must be blaspheming. So in invoking a call of blasphemy, and what is the demand of blasphemy in this day? It is death. The result of blasphemy or the punishment was death. So they accuse Jesus in this terrifying manner, an infuriating manner. Yet what does Jesus do? He doesn't back down. He takes it face on, and he dares to love anyway. Look at verse 24. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan if a kingdom divided if a kingdom is divided against itself? That kingdom cannot stand, and if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen, has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. Basically, Jesus is saying, Satan may be evil, but he isn't stupid. He knows that fighting against his own will hurry his own demise. So Jesus, as he's being approached in this terrifying manner, stands up and points out the illogical thinking of these scribes. The scribes who are supposed to know it all, who the people look at with great reverence and fear. He says, no, you are wrong. Your thinking is illogical. And as if that isn't enough, look what he continues to say. In verse 27, it says, But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong men. Then he indeed may plunder his house. What is Jesus saying with the short parable? He's saying Satan's the strong man and he has a domain of this world. Satan is full of sin and is full of Satan. In a way, it's his house. And Jesus has come into this house and he's binding the strong man. He's casting out demons. He's taking sons of disobedience and making them sons and daughters of righteousness. He's plundering the household of hell. And who's the only one who can do that? Who's the only one with authority over Satan? It is God. The archangel Michael and Jude and in 2 Peter, what does he do when he's face to face with Satan? He says, God, I'm going to call upon God to take care of you. It is through the power of God and only through the power of God can one defeat this foe. And Jesus is saying, I'm the strong man. And I've entered Satan's house and I'm bringing people unto myself. He's saying, I am God. And why does he say that? He's not saying it because the Pharisees are going to go, oh, really? We love you now. They're not going to say that at all. They're going to hate him all the more. He's saying that for your and my benefit. It's because you and I need to know that truth. It's because he dares to love us even by defying these Pharisees. He dares to love us in that way. Let me say it another way. Love, true love, always involves risk. True love 
always involves risk. Jesus at this moment could abandon this entire ministry and say, you know what, I'm sick of dealing with these scribes, these Pharisees, these religious elite. He could abandon all that hassle and never go to the cross. But he doesn't. Why? Because he loves you and me. He dares to love you and me so much to the point that throughout his life, he fights this religious authority, and at the end of his life, he takes on the cross. He dares to love you and me no matter what. Karl Barth, who I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, that theologian, he was alive and in Germany when the Nazis were beginning to rise to power. And when the Nazis were beginning to rise to power, they wanted to take control of the church. So they tried to establish the German Christian Church, which ultimately submitted to Hitler. And what did Karl Barth do in response to that? He dared to love Jesus Christ and defy that authority, no matter what the cost. He refused. He led the way in the Christian community into refusing to take, refusing to take the oath of ultimate allegiance to Hitler. And there was a price to pay. But where do you think he learned that type of love? Where did he learn to dare to love that way? He learned that from our Savior. He learned that from looking in our word, being changed by him, seeing in every aspect of Jesus' life that he's daring to stand up and love you and me, no matter who he has to defy. We have a Savior who is devoted to loving us, no matter what the cost. We have a Savior who dares to love us, no matter what the cost. We have an amazing Savior. And before we go on to the deep love of Jesus Christ, I want to address the unpardonable sin that Jesus warns these Pharisees with. So let's look at this briefly. Verse 28. Jesus says, once again defying, daring to defy these authorities for loving us, Verse 28, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. First, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you are worried about committing the unpardonable sin, there's one thing you need to do. And that is to stop worrying. Why? Why? Because Jesus loves you and you have been bought and you have been paid for and you have been sealed by the love of Jesus Christ and nothing can break that. Jesus Christ won't let you perform this sin. Where do I get that? Romans chapter 8 verses 35 through 39. Hopefully we all have it memorized. Let's talk about the power of Jesus' love. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, and we can say this also, he's talking about believers and the love we have in Jesus Christ. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation that includes you and me will be able to separate us from the love of god that is in christ jesus our lord the unpardonable sin is something a believer cannot do why because we cannot thwart god's predestination we cannot thwart his election and we cannot thwart his love he loves us too much to allow us to do that If he did allow it, it would be a contradiction of all of those doctrines. If you're worried as a believer of committing the unpardonable sin, I encourage you to stop because there is no need. Because you have the love of Christ. In Romans 11.29, what does it say? Romans 11.29, it tells us the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. They cannot be taken away. Your salvation is a gift from God. It is irrevocable your holy spirit is a gift from god it is irrevocable first peter one confirms this and says the holy spirit is a seal until the day of redemption irrevocable your spiritual gifts my spiritual gifts irrevocable cannot be destroyed the gifts and calling of god are irrevocable we have a god that loves us that much 
that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Therefore, he stops us from committing this sin. In Revelation, you read of the restrainer. And who is the restrainer? It's the Holy Spirit. And he restrains the people. And when the restrainer lets go, everything goes even more chaotic. We have a restrainer, a comforter, a counselor that will not let us go there. Why? Because his love is that great. His love is that great for you and for me. And I want to point out a few more things about this. Look at verse 30 again. It says, For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. That phrase, they were saying, is written in the continuous mode. In the Greek, it implies repetition. It implies a mindset. And it ties a, entitles a, a fixed opinion. What do the Pharisees, what do the scribes have? They have a fixed opinion. We see this beforehand, we see this here, and we see this afterhand. Their heart is hardened, and there's no turning back. It is a fixed mode. It is not like a one-time thing. You have to recognize that Jesus here is not saying at this moment, scribes, you're going to hell. He doesn't say that. He's warning them. Why is he even warning these enemies? Because he dares to love even his enemies. He is warning them. He's providing this warning, and it's a continuous action. As Ronald B. Allen, great theologian, please look into his work. Great man, all right, along with many others. He says, it is apparently not a single act of defiant behavior, but a continued state of opposition and it entered into willfully but irrevocably. And we see that amongst these scribes. And the way I'm going to say it has to be continuous is because what did Jesus' family do right before this? They're calling out and saying, you're insane, Jesus. Is that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Yes, because Jesus has been indwelled with and been working through the power of the Holy Spirit. So they're mocking the Spirit. They're of this mindset that Jesus is out of his mind. Yet at the cross and after the cross, upon the resurrection, who comes to faith in Jesus Christ? Who adopts him as his Savior and Lord? Mary, the mother of Jesus, who just thought he was out of his mind. The sons, they all become pillars within the church. James the Less writes James, the epistle of James. It is a continual state of mind that we throw away and we adopt the mindset that he gives us. We can also look to Paul. What is Paul at this time when this is written, when this is happening, excuse me? Paul is a Pharisee. And what does a Pharisee believe? The exact same thing as these scribes believe, that Jesus is out of his mind, he's possessed, and he is false. He is a liar. But who has written multiple books in the New Testament? It is Paul, because he laid aside this mindset through the power of Christ and adopted the mindset of Christ. So here, if you're here today, and you're worried about this, and you're like, I don't know about this believing thing, I would encourage you very much. Take this warning that Jesus gives these scribes, these Pharisees, take it as a warning to yourself. That Jesus loves you enough to warn you. To say, don't participate in this. Don't become hardened this way. Allow God to change your mindset. How? By believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. The one who gives you forgiveness. The one who has given you your life. And that's where I want to stop with the unpardonable sin. If you have more questions, if you want to say, John, you said this, I don't agree. Good? Please talk to me. Please talk to me. Please talk to me. Or talk to anyone of the elders. Talk to the person next to you. This is not an open dictatorship where John just says this. I'm not Jesus. I'm just trying to communicate this the best I know how. And hopefully God is working in this. And hopefully you're encouraged. But if you're confused and you have more questions, let's begin the conversation and let's talk about this more. Me spending five minutes on it is not going to solve this problem for everybody. Not at all. Next, we've dealt with an impartable sin. Now we're going to finish with the deep love of Jesus Christ. Let's look at this briefly. A brief love of Jesus Christ says, in verse 31, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. Now, from the reading this, you're like, okay, we had Jesus' family. They start to come. We have this interjection of the interaction with the Pharisees. And now they're finally arrived. And you may read this verse 31 and say, John, it doesn't seem like they're too adamant about getting a hold and stopping Jesus' ministry. But to that, I would, have to, I would say, remember the crowd that he's with, that Jesus is with. This is the crowd that when a paralytic came, 
and needed healing, they wouldn't let him in. In fact, the four men were able to push through the crowd. They had to go to the roof and dig through the roof. This crowd is captivated. They want to be the closest. They want to hear everything. They want to be in there. So Jesus' family, I don't care how adamant they are, these people are adamant too. And they stop, these, they stop Jesus' family from getting inside. They apparently allow word-of-mouth conversation to go through to Jesus. And then we come to verse 32, and it says, And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mothers and my brothers? And looking, around, looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. First point, Jesus is not disowning his family here. They think he's a lunatic, but he's not disowning them. At the cross, who does Jesus make provisions and care for? It's his mother Mary. Who becomes pillars in the church? It's these sons, it's these brothers of Jesus Christ. He's not disowning them as a result of their sin. He's taking this situation to teach a greater truth. And what is that greater truth? It's that your genetics have nothing to do with your salvation. Who you're related to, who your parents were, who your grandparents were, that has nothing to do with your salvation. That doesn't get you into the family of God at all. What gets us into the family of God? Jesus tells us, verse 35, it says, Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. What does it mean to do the will of God? John 6, 40, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son, Jesus Christ, believes in him, will have eternal life and be a part of the family of God for all of eternity. Our genetics, our parents, our friends, they don't save us. Only Jesus saves. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith and no one else. Salvation is individual. We're not saved because we're in a group. We're saved because Jesus individually changes our hearts, enlightens our eyes, and we come to him in faith and believe. And that is a beautiful, that is a wonderful thing. Just think about it. Just think about the aspects of this. It's not a relationship that's just completely casual that Jesus offers to us. It's not an acquaintanceship. It's not a business dealing. It's not something where Jesus is a car dealership and says, you know what, join the family. Buy something from me, earn something from me, and then I'll give you something. That's not the way the relationship with Jesus Christ works. How does it work? It's you and I nailing him to the cross with our sin. It's you and I nailing him to the cross with our sin and then recognizing that we did that and that he conquered us. He conquered our sin. And then saying, Jesus, to you be the glory. I believe you have done this. I believe in what you will do. And upon that, upon his finished work, we are saved. It's not genetics that save us, that bring us into the family of God. It is Jesus' work on the cross that we place our faith in. So with that, I want to close, and let's remember, we have seen the devoted, daring, and deep love of Jesus Christ. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, and you are longing to experience love, real love, that is devoted, daring, and deep, I encourage you to consider Jesus Christ. He's the only one who will offer that to you. He is the only one that will offer that to you. He is the only one who will offer that to you. If you have more questions, please talk to me. Please talk to anyone that was on the stage. Please talk to the person next to you and say, I'm interested. I want that love. Well, you can experience that love by believing in Jesus Christ, and I encourage you not to leave this room before you do that. Secondly, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I hope you are so encouraged. I hope you are so lifted up. You have a Savior who is devoted, daring, and deep in His love for you and me. Jesus loves us. This we know, for the Bible has told us so. Let's pray. Dear God, it is so good to bask in your word and see your love. 
see that you have a love that is devoted. You have a love that is daring. And you have a love that is deep. You are so good. We love you and we celebrate you. And pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.